I might like to turn back to that passage we read earlier, uh, Luke chapter 24. We're going to be looking at that passage about the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. I've called it, uh, title, The Right Kind of Heartburn. Uh, unfortunately, it's not original. Uh, dear Peter Williams actually used that title when he preached on this many, many years ago. And uh, I just couldn't help but think that that's the most suitable uh, title for a passage like this. It's about heartburn. Now, normally, we think of heartburn as something very negative and difficult, and you get all those um, adverts on the television about those little men that go through like little firemen and, you know, sort the problem out. Heartburn is quite a common thing, and it's not a very pleasant thing. But this kind of heartburn is quite different, isn't it? You notice when they said, were not our hearts burning? Well, they didn't have indigestion. But something more wonderful was happening. They were experiencing a warming of their heart and their minds. And we'll look at that in a little bit of detail in just a while. Uh, So there is the right kind of heartburn. And my prayer today is that you will experience some heartburn, but the right kind. Now, Luke, uh, we've been going through this account. This is the fourth in a mini-series where we've been working through the great resurrection account from Luke's perspective. And what's interesting here is he gives the first report, but he doesn't directly emphasize the risen Christ as much as the disappearance of the body. Did you notice that? And this first account gradually opens up the glorious truth that the body wasn't there because he was risen. And uh, that is what these two disciples were going to find out as they went on this road, coming out of Jerusalem, going presumably home to Emmaus uh, on this road. They have this incredible experience. And we see here a transition, a transformation rather, in the attitude of these disciples and everything is changed you see the story starts with seeming tragedy but ends up with certain triumph it's an incredible change that takes place in the life of these two disciples and my prayer will be in your life and my life too as we go along with them on this journey They are so certain that everything has gone horribly wrong. Instead, it's gone so wonderfully right. And what is so special about this passage is we have a direct intervention of Jesus himself. He comes into the story incognito to begin with. And that is so significant that Jesus should come into your story, into your life. But more than that, As he comes in, he opens up the word. So we have the two most important ingredients of all. The entrance of Jesus coming and opening up his word about him and changing these two lives. And my heart's cry is it will change your life too. Maybe you're not a believer. Perhaps this will be the first time you will listen to Jesus talking and opening up this word, or maybe you've known him for a long time, may it be a new experience for you. May your hearts burn within you as you hear these wonderful words again and maybe afresh. You know, God's word, when it's opened up, will always have an impact. It will never be lost on anyone. It will do one of two things. It will, it will harden or soften. It's like the the, the analogy of the sun. The very same sun that hardens clay melts the snow. And that can happen spiritually speaking. God is like the sun. His word is like the sun. And it can harden. It can take us further away if we reject him. Or it can draw us nearer. My heart's desire is that for all of us, it will draw us nearer. So, let's look at this wonderful story. The seeming tragedy, verses 13 to 24. 
It starts in the clouds, doesn't it? It's so gloomy. Look at these first few verses. Now, that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles. Note that seven miles, because they do the return journey a little later. Seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened, i.e. the Easter story. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. So here is the opening scene. It's in the aftermath of the crucifixion. And it's been a stumbling block to these two disciples as it was to many. They could not make sense of it. And as we will see, they had assumed something else was going to happen. The story has been taken. It's been hijacked by Satan in some way. And it's all gone horribly wrong. And that comes out clearly Uh, as we'll see in a moment. But they are therefore feeling desperate. They're confused. They're in darkness. They're stumbling. The crucifixion is so often a stumbling block. 1 Corinthians 1, 23, Paul says it is a stumbling block to many, particularly to the Jews, because they could not understand how a Messiah could die in such uh, a way. They wanted something completely different. And we've seen as we've been working through the Gospel of John in the evenings that the expectation was that the Messiah was going to be some kind of a general that will come and uh, take on the Romans and, and defeat them. They were thinking of a military leader, a kind of a Joshua, which of course is the name Jesus. But Jesus was at pains to tell his disciples and try and explain to them throughout his life and ministry that wasn't what he was coming to do. He was after another kingdom. It wasn't a a physical, literal kingdom. But that's what they believed. And that is why when he died and was crucified, it was a stumbling block. It completely threw them. They'd lost the plot. They didn't understand what was happening. still true today, isn't it? For so many people, uh, Easter is, okay, it's a nice occasion in some ways, but... They don't really get it. The Good Friday really sticks in the throat. Why good when something bad happened? Because they can't see the bigger picture that Jesus had to suffer, as he goes on to explain here. So there's confusion. And they've heard rumors about a missing body. Notice the emphasis is on the missing body. They seem to have forgotten what the angels said. And so Jesus enters incognito into this situation. Now, the commentators make all sorts of reasons why they couldn't see him. I'm not really interested in that. Jesus is Jesus. He just decided for his good reasons that he would conceal his true identity. He wanted them to focus on his word, on what he was going to teach them. Maybe if he'd made himself known then, they would have been more in awe of you know, holding him and Jesus, and, and, and they needed to listen to this word. So he... In some way or other, we don't know exactly how he did it, he prevented them from recognizing him. Maybe his body was so transformed that they couldn't, I don't know. It doesn't really matter. All that matters is he decided to do it that way. And so they did not know it was Jesus who would come alongside them. And as a stranger, he asked them those questions. And the reason why he was doing that is not because he didn't know this was often Jesus' way. This was his way. Uh, you look through the Gospels, he would, he would ply his disciples with questions, but really he was drawing out from them what they were able to do so, uh, to understand so that he could teach them. And that's what he does here. Look at what he says. He asks them some very obvious questions. Verse 17, he asks them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? And they seemed to be puzzled by his question. They stood still, their faces downcast. And one of them, named Cleopas, asked, and you can almost sense the astonishment in his voice, can't you? Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened these days? And he continues his question. What things? About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. And here we see where they are. They're at. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed, before God and all people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death. And they crucified him. 
No, notice the next bit. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. You see, they're back to the, the Messiah military leader. He was going to redeem them. They didn't understand the word redeem in the sense that we now understand it. And what is more, it's the third day since all this took place. And then to add to the confusion, in addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find his body. They came and told us that they'd seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But they did not see Jesus. They did not see the body. So you see, they've had some inkling. They've had some um, tokens of truth. They've heard about the, the women going there and that the body wasn't there. And they heard about Peter and John going there. And they'd heard about an angel. And yet, they still couldn't grasp what was going on. And maybe for some of us who've been Christians a long time, we think, well, how on earth could they not get it? But, you know, that is the problem often with many folk. It's not a matter of intelligence. Some of the brainiest people on the planet are not Christians. It's not a matter of intelligence. It's a matter of spiritual understanding, which is not the same thing. And you'd think that these disciples would have grasped it, but they hadn't, because their mind was focused on this idea that Jesus was going to be this great military leader who would usher in a new kingdom on earth. And when he died, it all fell apart. It went wrong. They had this misunderstanding that somehow it had all gone wrong. He was victim crucified. Hope was lost. So what was their hope? Well, it was, it was still based on an earthly kingdom, on getting rid of the Romans, on getting back to the time of, of the great King David and Solomon. You know, when a new kingdom would be restored, it'd be all like that again. After all, was this not David's greatest son? They had not got hold of the bigger picture of what Jesus was really uh, talking to them about. It was a misunderstanding which led to confusion and despair and very much an earthly kingdom. And of course, as the days went by, as they hint there, it got, it got worse. And yet they should have known better, shouldn't they, really? Because in that first little passage of um, chapter 24... Where, where the, the women there in the morning, let me just read it a moment. Um, they found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. This is an angel speaking to them. They're telling them plainly, aren't they? He is not here. He's risen. Remember how he told you. Then the angels go on to say, he actually said these things while he was still in the body. The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. But you see, these disciples had heard this message. They knew about an angel and that the angel said, Jesus told you this when he's alive, but they still couldn't get hold of it. I wonder, is that how you see Easter? You know a lot about it. You've heard the stories, but it's like the, the jigsaw pieces haven't been put together. The penny hasn't dropped. You know lots of things and facts the glorious truth that he had to die has just not got hold of you yet. I pray that as he opened up these disciples' minds, maybe he'll open up yours too. Let's look at the second part where he talks about the certain triumph. We get this in verse 25 down to verse 35 where we see uh, the change here. Jesus rebukes them. First he there's a general rebuke and then a more specific one. The general rebuke comes in verse 25, 
where he says this. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I've lost my place now. Yeah. He said to them, how foolish are you and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. He says you're foolish. And that was quite a derogatory term. Was he fair in saying that? I mean, they were only men. Maybe they just hadn't grasped it. Well, I believe they were foolish because they should have known their scriptures better. But he goes on to say that uh, more specifically, doesn't he, in verse 26 onwards, where he says, and the point he makes here, is that Christ had to suffer. Let me read what it says. Um, Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory and then beginning with Moses and all the prophets he explained to them what was said in the scriptures concerning himself that verse is very important it's very key it's the nutshell of the gospel did not the Messiah they knew who the Messiah was but they got the wrong idea didn't he have to suffer now in Old Testament thinking a suffering Messiah was a paradox it was a contradiction in terms a Messiah cannot suffer But Jesus had told them, and he goes on to explain in the scripture, yes, the Messiah did have to suffer. And so we get this wonderful um, picture that comes up. Now, Jesus does rebuke them because they should have known better. I've got a few slides here. If we could have the first one, here's some of the reasons, they're not all of them, why they should have known better. They had little excuse. They would have known their Old Testament. And one of the key verses was Genesis 3.15 where it says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head. They're talking about the Messiah. And you will strike his heel. In John 12.31.32, Jesus says this to them. Now is the time for judgment of this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from earth will draw all people to myself. He was telling them that he would have to suffer. He would be the one who would have this confrontation with the devil. Can we have the second slide, please? On another occasion, we have Psalm 118. These disciples would have known this. That says, the stone the builders has rejected becomes the cornerstone. A stone that's rejected, it doesn't mean a little pebble, it's like a rock, will one day not be rejected, but actually be the cornerstone. But it would be rejected. In Luke 20, 17, and this is immediately after the telling of the parable of the tenant tenant farmers. Do you remember that that they had a vineyard and the owner sends his servants there and each one gets brutally beaten. And so he sends his son, who of course is Jesus, and he gets killed. And the Jews recognized that he was talking about himself there. So it was talking about his suffering. And Jesus says after that, Jesus looked directly at them and asked, what then is the meaning of, sorry, then what is the meaning of that which is written? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. He's quoting from Psalm 18, 118. This, he said immediately after the parable. He's saying, in effect, yeah, I am that stone and I will be rejected, which involves suffering. The third slide, please. This is perhaps a bit more obvious and direct. Isaiah 53, 12 says, Therefore I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Luke, and I find this remarkable now, in Luke chapter 22, 37, Jesus speaking says, It is written, he's quoting from Isaiah 53 above, And he was numbered with the transgressors. And then he goes on to say, And I tell you that this must be fulfilled in me. Yes, what is written about me is reaching its fulfillment. Couldn't be much clearer. Now, these disciples may well have been there at that time when Jesus was talking this. Or they certainly would have known people close by who would have related the story. And yet... They couldn't see it. They had missed the point. Well, of course, Jesus then goes on to give them this most wonderful Bible study. If we could have slide four, please. Now, 
You can, I just put it up there just to give you the impression of some of the scriptures. They're not the entire scriptures, but they are some of the key ones that Jesus may well have opened up to them. And you can see there's a lot there. Some very familiar ones, a lot. Um, there's the Genesis one we just quoted. Genesis 22, verse 18. Of course, you remember Abraham sacrificing Isaac. Uh, in, num- in Exodus 12, we've got the Passover lamb and so on. There are references, many references in the Psalms, in Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Micah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. They're all talking about Jesus, and Jesus opens them up. I would love to have been there as he opened it and explained what these verses meant. Who better than Jesus himself to have done that? Now, he may have done it a different way. We don't know precisely how he opened up these scriptures. That could, be, could have been the chronological way. He could have started first with the historical and then looked at the types in, 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 in various people. Uh, you know, um, Joseph in Genesis was a type of Christ, wasn't he? He saves his people. Joshua was a type of Christ. David was a type of Christ. He could have gone through that method. Or he could have talked about the promises and the prophecies. We don't know. But what we do know is Jesus made it very clear to them that he is there, saturated in the Old Testament, everywhere, if we have but eyes to see. And obviously these disciples didn't, and Jesus gave them those eyes. Now, I've highlighted some in in bold, uh, deliberately. They are particular passages that speak of his suffering. All those passages speak of his ministry and what he would become, but the, the bold ones particularly speak of his suffering. They make reference to his having to suffer, either as the lamb, uh, as in Exodus 12, 13, and so on. And then there's that wonderful passage in, um, in Psalm 22 that seems to be the very words of Jesus. You know, verse 1, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? David said those words when he wrote them down. But he was speaking in prophecy, and Jesus said them on the cross. And that, that psalm is so amazing, isn't it? Because it, it's almost like it's a portrayal of the crucifixion way back in the psalms. And then, of course, Isaiah 53 uh, and so on. There are many references there. Thank you. So we have just an idea here of what Jesus may have uh, been speaking to them about. And it would have been an incredible Uh, experience for them as it was to prove well time went on and uh, they met they were near near in their house and and Jesus goes as if to carry on but uh, they call him in um, eastern hospitality they want him to be there with them and uh, as a as a guest they give him the honor of breaking bread and so they have a meal and he breaks bread and it's at that point things suddenly come alight. Uh, Look at what they said. When he was at the table with them, he took bread and gave thanks and broke it and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. There must have been a a, a sort of mixture of joy and frustration. Can you imagine that? At last they realized who this stranger is who's been talking to them, giving them this Bible study all along the dusty road. They realize it's Jesus and then he disappears from their sight. There would have been joy and probably a bit of frustration as well. Oh, if only we'd realized earlier who we were talking to. I'm sure people in a lesser sense have maybe had experiences where some famous person uh, they've been talking to and hadn't realized quite who they were. And then later on, someone says, you do realize who that was, don't you? And they think, oh, if only I'd known, I would have got the autograph book out. And uh, but magnify that a million billion times. They suddenly realized the person they'd been talking to, this stranger, was Jesus. How did they recognize it? Well, again, the commentators have a field day on trying to speculate on precisely how. It would probably seem sometime through the breaking of bread, maybe they saw the holes in his hands. He allowed them to see them then. Uh, Maybe it was his voice, the way he spoke. Maybe just a familiarity with that last supper. I don't know. But suddenly they realized... And then he was gone. But look at the, uh, the response. Uh, they are ready to go. Well, let's look at uh, something by way of application. Because what was it that had happened? What had changed their life? Well, 
They had burning hearts. What do we mean by this? Well, firstly, I think it means that their minds were enlightened. It's important that we understand that. This wasn't just emotionalism. It wasn't just tingly feelings. Remember what Jesus was doing. He was teaching them. He was informing them. He was explaining things to them. This was an intellectual activity. It was teaching. That's the first thing he did. He addressed their minds and corrected them. They were in a state of confusion and he needed to explain, to correct and to extend their knowledge and their understanding. And it was also an important transition because they were coming into New Testament times now where the visual was less important and the verbal was more important. And people still muddle this up today uh, when, when the emphasis is put on what we can see in a church building and how ornate it might look. I'm not necessarily saying that's wrong, but it can become a stumbling block. It's what we hear and understanding. Paul says that faith comes by hearing and by preaching. There's a great emphasis now put in the New Testament on preaching and teaching, on what we are able to understand. You see, it wasn't so much that Jesus was there physically with them. He was preparing them for a change. Remember what he said to the disciples in the upper room. He he said, I'm going, uh, but I'm going to send another comforter. And what will that comforter do? Not give you a warm, fuzzy feeling like some sort of cozy blanket. He will teach you. He will guide you. He will instruct you. He will empower you. The Holy Spirit. And they will be informed so that they, in turn, can go and teach others. So it was important that that was put first. He informed their minds. That is the New Testament focus. The very first uh, words of John 1, 1 is, In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. It was a Word-based ministry. That's why here at Mordown Baptist Church and other similar churches, we put so much emphasis on the preaching and on hearing what God has to say. It's so important. But it didn't end there. It wasn't merely an academic exercise. It wasn't just a, a historical meeting where we talk and discuss things. We're talking here about preaching, not just teaching. And that involves the heart as well. It's something we embrace completely. He warmed their hearts. I believe when they say he warmed their hearts, something did take place emotionally as well. Starts with the mind, but the emotions are affected as well. God created us with feelings. It's his idea. We're meant to be fully involved in every way, providing we get that order right. When we put it round the other way, we'll get problems if we focus on the emotions first before the understanding. But the understanding comes first. And from the understanding, if we really understand it, our hearts and our feelings will be transformed as well. That's why they said, weren't our hearts warmed? What was happening to those disciples? Suddenly their minds were opening up and being enlightened. But as they were being enlightened, they were being excited and thrilled. This really is Jesus. Jesus of Nazareth, the one we've been talking with. He's the one in the Old Testament that they're speaking about in in Psalm 22 and in Isaiah 53. It's him. We've just been talking with him. The crucifixion wasn't the end. The resurrection was the next step. He's alive. The angels, now I get it. They told us these things. We should have known better. They were so excited. And uh, what did they do? Well, they couldn't stay. They didn't just say, well, wasn't that wonderful? Wasn't that an amazing experience? I'll tell my grandchildren about this, that we met with Jesus on the road. We had a meal with him. Well, let's hit the sack, go to bed. No, they are as awake as awake can ever be. They've just walked seven miles. It's evening. They're tired. They've not finished their meal. What do they do? They go back. Why? Because they've got good news. They've got to tell the others. Maybe they're not quite sure. Maybe those uh, other disciples are still in misery. We've just been told we know it's true. He's alive. He's risen. Oh, let's go back. Never mind the dark. Never mind the the danger, the thieves on the road. Do you know, maybe they were even half running. Maybe they were energized in a way that they couldn't have explained. You know, when God works in revivals, strange things can happen. I'm not saying this necessarily happened here, but it wouldn't surprise me. 
Uh, you know, we hear of miners who were out to, to meetings to three o'clock in the morning, four o'clock in the morning, and they got up after an hour's sleep to do a full day's work and farm labourers and so on. They were energised because they were so full of God and the Holy Spirit. Maybe in some way, I mean, to suddenly take a seven-mile journey back when you just got there, who does that? You know, you've walked seven miles on a dusty road, you're tired and hungry, and you think, oh, well, let's go back again. Something has got to happen in your life to do that, unless you're some sort of superhero athlete or just plain crazy and you fancy the idea of running back. These disciples were revolutionized. They were, they were just full of joy. They had to go back and tell the others. So let me just draw to a close. We must never see faith in cold intellectual terms as if it's some theory to understand. No, it is warm, it is emotional, it is full of truth. And I want to ask you, does the word satisfy you in that way? Does it warm your heart as well as tickle your intellect? If not, why not? If it doesn't, maybe it's for one of the following reasons. You're not a true believer, and you still need to know this gospel for the first time. You are a true believer, but you've not grown in your faith. You've not got hold of all these wonderful truths and had your mind stimulated and your heart warmed. Or you are a believer, but you've allowed these things to be eclipsed. It's like the clouds coming over the sun. Earlier on at the beginning I said God's word always affects us, making us either softer or harder, towards the things of God or away from them. We cannot remain neutral. Don't be fooled by that. God expects a response from us. His word will not return empty, says Isaiah. So can I ask you, how are you going to respond to Christ and his word? Will your hearts be warmed or will you just dismiss it? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we just come to you now. Each one of us, you know our hearts. You know whether they're warm or cold or indifferent. Help us, Lord, not to treat this as just another Sunday, another sermon that may be interesting, may have been boring. No, Lord, help us to see Jesus in all his glory, as he should be seen. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.